morning. Well, uh, it is spring now, right? It's kind of warm, nice and warm, right? Uh, but today's poem is uh, very sad, very uh, dismal, right? And uh, the, the, the poem is about the war, the guerrilla war uh, between uh, Ireland and UK, right? Uh, in 1919, uh, they broke out a guerrilla war right, between the IRA, Irish Republican Army. They called themselves. Uh, they rose against uh, the United uh, British government. And uh, about uh, 3,000 people were killed. And as a, as a result of this war, uh, the island became an independent country. Still, northern part is belong to what? Uh, uh, after this, we are going to study another poem, uh, Easter 1919, uh, Easter poem. And it's also about the uh, uprising against the British government. Um, and uh, this poem is a kind of kind of long poem. It has uh, 16 stanzas. And, uh, but it's, it's such a complex poem. It's so complex that uh, Professor uh, Michael Wood spent a lot of time doing this poem, right? So it, he published a, a book uh, studying the single poem, 1919. So uh, it was published by Oxford University Press, the, the best uh, press in the world, right? And the whole, the whole book is about this single point, right? So it must be a very complex poem, right? And I also did a poem and uh, published it in this, in this uh, journal, hmm? Foreign Literature Studies. This is the famous uh, Art and Cite Humanity Citation Index Journal, right? So I published this article uh, last year, and we are going to uh, read uh, 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 this article today and on Thursday. It's a kind of long article. So uh, before we go to the article, we are going to read the whole poem. I think uh, you've gone through the uh, article itself and you summarize it, so you, you have a rough idea of uh, what the poem is, right? So let's uh, go through the, let's read the poem itself, right? The whole poem. Okay, 1919. Uh, many ingenious, uh, ingenious lovely things are gone. They seem the sheer miracle to the multitude, protected from the circle of the moon that pitches common things about. There stood amid the ornamental bronze and stone, an ancient image made of olive wood. And are gone five years famous ivories and all the golden grasshoppers and bees. Can you understand it? Uh, what, uh, what is about? The stand is about what? The stanza. Right? Uh, the title, the, the poem title is 1919. So we expect uh, this poem to talk about the war itself. It doesn't, right? It doesn't. It's kind of strange, right? Many ingenious lovely things are gone. Certainly, uh, the time refers to one, the current moment, right? Many, many things are gone. Many ingenious, uh, ingenious, lovely things are gone. That seemed sheer miracle to the multitude. That seemed sheer miracle to the multitude, meaning uh, the general people, right? Miracle, they, they seemed. So he's going to talk about uh, old history, right? Uh, protected from the circle of moon. What does it mean? Protected from the circle of moon. Uh, this is uniquely uh, Yeechen, right? Yeechen is philosophy, right? Uh, uh, human beings uh, could belong one of the faces, 28 faces of moon, right? Face one, face two, and things like that. So Yeechen uh, had a special uh, philosophy, right? He uh, classified humanity uh, human beings into 28 different faces, right? 
So protect from the so-called moon that pitches common things about, pitches common things about. There stood amid the ornamental bronze and stone, there stood an ancient image. There stood an ancient image. Image of what? Made of uh, olive wood, made of olive, olive wood. Uh, and uh, gone are five years famous ivory. Five years? Must be sculptured, right? Five years famous ivory and the golden grasshoppers and bees. So these are what? Made by the sculptor, sculptor, five years, right? We too had many pretty toys when young. So he talked about ancient uh, uh, civilization. Now in, in stanza two, th uh, the speaker is going to talk about uh, today, right? So we too had many pretty toys when young. A law indifferent to blame or praise, to bribe or a threat. Young people, right? Young people, right? But they are indifferent. They are indifferent to blame or praise or to bribe or a threat. Habits that made old wrong, that habits that made old wrong melt down as it were wax in the sun's rays. Public opinion ripening for so long, we thought it would outlive all future days. Oh, what fine thought we had, because we thought that the worst rogues and rascals had died out. Old teeth were drawn, old teeth were drawn, all ancient tricks unlearned, and the great army but a showy thing. What matter that no cannon had been turned into a plowshare? Parliament king thought that unless a little powder bound that trumpeters might burst with trumpeting, and that it lacked all glory and pretense, the guards' drowsy char charges would not prance. So we are in peace time, so we don't need the guns, right? Things like that, right? Now these are, now these are dragon ridden, the nightmare rise upon sleep, the drunken soldier can leave the mother, murdered at the door, to crawl in her own blood and go scot-free. So he is uh, talking about the uh, war, guerrilla war, right? People are killed, right? And um, a drunken soldier, right? A drunken soldier can leave the mother, the mother, a young mother, murdered at the door, killed her and left her to crawl in her own blood. But he, he uh, went scot-free, right? The night can sweat with terror as before. We pieced our thoughts into philosophy and planned to bring the world under rule who are but whistles fighting in a hole. So they are, they are like whistles, animals, whistles fighting in a hole, human beings, right? They are compared to whistle. He who can read the signs, nor sink a name into the half deceit of some intoxicant from shallow wits, who knows no work can stand, whether health, wealth, or peace of mind was spent, on masterwork of intellect or hand. No honor leave his mighty monument, has but one comfort left. All triumph would but break upon his ghostly solitude. But is there any comfort to be found? Man is in love and loves what vanishes. What more is there to say? That country round, none dared admit. If such a thought were his, incendiary or bagat, could be found to burn that stump on the Acropolis or break in bits the famous ivories and traffic and the grasshopper's bees. Uh, okay, stanza one, uh, section one, section two. When uh, Louis Fuller's Chinese dancers in, in wound a shining web, a floating ribbon of cloth, it seemed that Dragon of Air had fallen among dancers had rolled them round or hurried them off on his own furious path. So the platinum year rolls out new right and wrong, rolls in the old instead. All men are dancers, and their tread goes to the barbarous clangor of a gong. Section three, one stanza, se uh, section one. Uh, section three, some moralist or mythologist poet compares the solitary soul to a swan. I am satisfied with that. 
satisfied if a troubled mirror show it before that brief gleam of its light be gone, an image of its state, the wings half spread for flight, the breast thrust out in pride, whether to play or to ride, those winds that clamor of opposing night. A man in his own secret meditation is lost amid the labyrinth that he has made in art or politics. Some pl Platonists affirm that in the station where we should cast off body and trade, the ancient habit sticks, and that if our works could but vanish with our breath, that were lucky death, for triumph can but mar our solitude. This one can leap into the sol uh, desolate heaven. That image can bring wildness, to bring a rage, to end all things, to end that what my laborious life imagined, even the half imagined, the half written page. All but we dream to mend whatever mischief seemed to afflict mankind, but now that winds of winter blow, learn that we were crack pated when we dreamed. Section 4. We who seven years ago talked of honor and truth, shrieked with pleasure if we show the whistle twist, the whistle tooth. Section 5. Come, let us mark at the great that had such burdens on the mind and toiled so hard and late to leave some monument behind, nor thought of the leveling wind. Come, let us mark at the wise with all those calendars whereon they fixed all the aching eyes. They never saw how season ran, how now but gave it the sun. Come, let us mark at the good that fancied goodness might be gay and sick of solitude might proclaim a holiday, wind shrieked, and where are they? Mark, mark us after that, that would not lift a hand, maybe, to help good, wise or great, to bar that foul storm out, for we traffic in mockery. Section six, violence of fun upon roads, violence of horses. Some few have handsome riders, are garlanded on delicate sensitive ear, or t tossing mane, but Weary the running round and round in their courses. All break and vanish, and evil gathers head. Herodias, daughters had, have returned again, a sudden blast of dusty wind uh, after thunder of feet, tumult of images, their purpose in the labyrinth of wind. Should some crazy hand dare touch a daughter, all turn with amorous cries or cry, angry cries according to wind. For all are blind, but now wind drops, dust settles, thereupon their roach is past, his great eyes without thought, under the shadow of stupid straw pale locks, that in sullen fin the Robert Ariston, to whom the love lorn lady caught Tyler, brought bones peacock feathers, red combs of her cocks. Nineteen nineteen. Is it war? Right? <laughs> Not exactly, right? Uh, okay, here is the summary. Uh, this is the summary of this article. Uh, I did, right? And the, the title of the article is Architectonics of Forming Content in the Ages 1919. Architectonics, have you heard of the term, the word architectonics? Have you heard architecture, right? Architecture, right? Building. Tectonics means structure, architectonics. So, so in other words, uh, the structure of form and content, something like that. And the uh, summary of the uh, essay is, Yeats's poem, 1919, is often regarded as a political poem. Then it becomes a problem. Right. The six-part poem deals with new topics in each part with various stanzaic forms. It is random and heterogeneous to those people who see it as a political treatment. The present ar author argues that though it has originated in a political situation in Ireland, the poet speaker has his eyes and heart set toward the stars and man's heart. The system of the poem is architectonics in form, to borrow Wendler's word, or Cezanne's collector specialist Barnes. Though simplified, 
deformed and objectified. The poem's four main content are structured to an end, a vista of the general history of art and humanity and definition of humanity. My essay is focused on semantics with the for, uh, formal principle of architectonics as a base of poem. Okay, uh, let's go to my article section one. Of the scholars who studied 1919, Helen Wendler devotes one of the chapters of the book, Our Sacred Discipline, the Asian Lilic Poem, a uh, really poem published in uh, 2007, is a great book. Uh, uh, to this single poem, and Michael Wood, I've just introduced him to you. Michael Wood deals with his single poem using all the chapters of his book, The Asian Fallen, Oxford University Press, published in nine, uh, 2010. Uh, 2010. Uh, Wendler's chapter is a study of the poem's poetic form, which is almost exhaustive and whose whole book explicates this single poem based on Wendler's uh, uh, Long and Batch and others, as well as his insights into Yeats's po poetry. These critics, in general, try to see the poem as coherent, and I agree with them. However, some critics think the progress of poem is random and heterogeneous, and the title is misleading, italics my emphasis. According to Barney, just as the titles such as 1919 offer at the outset the promise of specific detail that is immediately betrayed once the, once the poem begins. So the neat numerical ordering of the interiors of the latter two poems, uh, the other two poems, Meditations in Time of Civil War, uh, this is a great poem, implies that some kind of structural clarity and rigidity exist that determine the sequential development of the narrator's utterances when actually few, if any, conventional devices signaling continuity can be found. Even the permissive unifying principle of analogy is eroded by the sheer randomness and heterogeneity of the tropical, topical proceeding of such poems. Another scholar thinks the poem develops according to an ana analogy of elements that do not really belong together in the same uh, space, Barney. This paper claims that Yeats must have, been, must have a certain principle in mind when he was writing this poem, aimed at finding that principle in 1919. Both Wendler and Wood are well aware, aware of the diversity of forms in it. But, when, but then, what is the principle behind the structure? It is to me the architectonic nature of form form as meaning, as in Sir John, still life and landscape painting. Wendler and Polov, another great uh, scholar, Polov, right? Uh, Wendler and Polov, they are, okay, uh, have already analyzed the poem, poem form in their books, though they did not call its aspects formal architectonics. And this paper focused on the uh, semantic architectonics in this poem. Uh, in this poem, form supports the poet's intention rather, rather clearly, as the later Yeats is now a master metrist, who has not only mastered the conventional poetic form, but also invented new poetic form, the ten-line stanza in English poetry. He seems to have a keen sense of structure of forms in poetry as well. In particular, in a series of poems such as 1919, Meditation Time of Civil War, Wendler and Wood spend much time interpreting the architectonic interrelationships of the form, forms and contents in 1919. In 1919, form matters more than in traditional epics, narrative poems. Polov would discuss 60 poems in a pioneer study of Yeats's power of prosody in the rhyme and meaning in Poetry of Yeats, published in 1970. Touches on 1919 in passing, but in a significant way for architectonic buildable of poems. Historically, art and poetry developed almost simultaneously. In the 1900s, in art, form achieves supremacy over content. Further, separation of form and content takes place. So does it in poetry. At the time, Cezanne plays a crucial role in changing the course of an art history by 
revolutionizing the way people look at things. Gurdjieff Stein, another uh, great writer, uh, her writing is cub cubistic, cubist writing. Uh, Picasso and uh, Gertrude Stein were friends, very close friends. And uh, when Picasso came to Paris in the, or in the early 1900s, he was unknown. And uh, he showed his painting to people, and they were indifferent. They didn't like it, but uh, Stein liked it very much. And she wrote a crit criticism mm. uh, for him, and he became famous. Right? Okay, uh, uh, okay. Uh, Gertrude Stein, poet, novelist, art critic, and patron of writers and artists in the early 1900s of Paris, France, is a central figure in Paris who introduces, introduces to writers in, in Paris, Pablo Picasso, who has found the principal cubism, Paul Cezanne, to invent cubism with Brock. Stein and Picasso are mutual influences on, it, uh, on each other. Stein imitates Picasso's cubist style in a poetry, while Picasso writes something like Stein's poetry. Stein's writing has widespread influences on our contemporaries, including Pablo Picasso as a poet. Pablo Picasso as a poet, have you heard of it? Picasso wrote great poem, maybe the greatest uh, poetry. Right? He was a poet, right? He stopped painting for uh, uh, for several several years, devoting himself to uh, writing poetry, can you believe it? <laughs> right. Uh, Sir Sherwood Anderson, Wallace Stevens, Col William Carlos Williams, Ernest Hemingway, to cite a few. But in fact, Picasso and Stein's principle of art and literature originated from Paul Cezanne as proto cubist, proto cubist, first cubist. Cezanne was a first cubist. It seems that Yeats was in contact with French Impressionism, although he saw Impressionist paintings, including those of Degas and Monet, it is clear that Yeats has never mentioned Cezanne painting in his writing. Probably he has never seen Cezanne painting, but they lived in the same intellectual background. The fact that I'm, I, I can confirm the same principle of composition Yeats and Cezanne works is not just a coincidence. Section two. What is the logical and formal flaw in 1919? Each part is not linear, but circular and self-contained, with strong disparate images, dancing and whirling, but the images are still are illustrated in a circular manner. That is, each part is a complete poem toward one architectonic end. The problem is that if you want to read 1919 as, as you used to, the poem may be incoherent incomprehensible to you. 1919 is of six parts. In this poem, there is a strong sense of form and structure, which I call architectonic. Yeats has always had the poetic form in mind when composing a poem. As we see in Yeats's letters, Yeats says in his letters, it, may, it was many years before I understood that I had surrendered, surrendered myself to the cheap temptation of the artist Creation without all, metrical com composition is always very difficult to me. Nothing is done upon the first day. Not one rhyme is, is in its place. And when at last the rhymes begin to come, the final love draft of six line stanza takes the whole day. At the time, I had not formed the style. Sometimes the six line stanza would take several days and not seem finished, even then and I had not learned, as I have now, to put it all out of my head before night. And so the last night was gen uh, generally sleepless, and the last day, a day of nervous strain. Now you understand? Uh, Yeats's poem uh, is a uh, very uh, intricate form, but uh, he made a lot of effort to make it, right? So. Also, Harvey Gross mentions how Yeats compo composed the poem. It is reported that Yeats first wrote this line out as a prose and count counted the meters off on his fingers. It is also reported that he always had a tune in his head when he composed. Now, let us think about the content in 1919. 
when the poem written in 1919 was published in the Dial in September 1921 and then in the London Mercury in November 1921, the title was Thoughts Upon the Present State of the World. The change in the title is significant in two ways. First, Yeats wants to distance himself in his poem from the present state of the politics in Ireland. It is not wrong to say that the poem arose out of some horrors at Gort. County Galway during the period when fighting between the Irish Republican Army and the English Army and Royal Irish Con uh, Constabulary, IRC, uh, increased. Yeats it may have been motivated to write a poem, raising bitterly at the deeds of British soldiery. But that does not mean that 1919 is a political poem, just as Lydon's one is not. Though both have their origin in political situation. Similarly, is it, it is not a simply a post-colonial poem, as Doggett argues in writing out chaos, out of chaos, construction of history in the ages 1919, and meditation time of civil war. It is because it is not a political poem per se. Uh, uh, a political poem, po political poem uh, the second poem, uh, second poem is a political poem in the face of the civil war, meaning, uh, okay, and the war poem while the first is not. Accordingly, it may not be correct to label these two poems as companion poems in terms of style and manner, despite the title, 1919, uh, it is an apolitical poem on a, pro on a more profound subject, which this paper attempts to argue. If 1919 had been intended to be a political poem, he would not have changed the title, Thoughts Upon the Present State of the World, right? to the uh, new one. Yeats's uh, intention has always been well reasoned by Fauché's 1983 essay. Yeats is 1919. Uh, chronology, chronology and chronic misleading. I agree with uh, Fauché that the poem is much more akin to a poem like The Second Coming, written instantly in 1919, than to one like Easter 1916. We are going to read this poem later. But this poem is still being misread. Why did Yeats change the titles, uh, poem's title to a more specific 1919? It is in part because Yeats has always wanted to make his poetry impersonal and universal, as in Ferguson uh, uh, Droid. I see my life go drifting like a river, from change to change. I've been many things. All these things were wonderful and great, but now I have grown nothing, knowing nothing, knowing all. As we see in the last line above, Yeats has long been dreaming of making his poetry impersonal. He pursues a poetic form when very young, as in the poem written in September 1888, anticipating sailing to Byzantium, which is another architectonic masterpiece in my mind, or 1919. He said in his letter to Catherine Tinan, dated uh, 22nd, 28th, September 1888, Lately, I have read much of George Meredith's poems. They are very beautiful and have far more su suavity, serenity than I had expected. Henley is very cobwebby about them and not very spontaneous. To me, Henley's uh, great fault is his form. It is never accidental, but always preconceived. His poems are forced into a mold. A poem should be a law to itself as plants and beasts are. It may be so much finished, but all finish should merely make plain that law. Uh, it's from uh, his letter. In another letter, which dated uh, 21st December 1888 to her, the want of your portly is, I think, the want also of my own. We, both of us, need to substitute more and more the landscapes of nature for the landscape of art. I myself must have another kindred need to substitute the feelings and longings of nature for those of art. It tells my emphasis. This effort is comparable to Cezanne's law of painting. This long dream is realized in 1919. 
1919 is now a poem of art and human history in general. It is not about specific art, but about the general history of art. Though the poem specifically exemplifies the Greek art, just as the poem begins with a specific time in Irish history. As a picture cannot exist in the void, the poem needs something to rely on, to theorize about the system, and to make an image uh, take on, on a universal meaning. The poem uses the simplification and objectification, object, objectification of an image facing an object or a group of objects to use in its work. Though this essay is not a comparative study of Asian Sejan, and as I would like to base part of my argument on Sejan's theory and practice painting, I want to use Sejan's ideas first about form. In a reproduction sketchbook of Sejan's sketchbook figures, a portraits, landscape, and still life, which was purchased by the Art Institute of Chicago in 1951, Carl O. Schneewind makes a significant closing remark in his introduction to his sketchbook. Cezanne's fame rests largely today on his oils and watercolors. His drawings are less known, and too little attention has been paid to their importance in his entire work. Distortions and simplifications found chiefly, found chiefly in the oils are often, with the superficial reasoning, attributed to a lack of draftsmanship. On the contrary, Cezanne skillfully deviates from the known form. Well, uh, can you understand it? If you look at Cezanne painting, what, 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 do you, uh, what do you think of it? If you, if you look at Cezanne painting, it's kind of poor, right? right? Oh, he, he's a bad painter, you will think. But that is, that is not, actually. He's really good uh, draftsman. He makes good sketches, right? Uh, 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 on a canvas, form, form, human forms, distorted. Why? It's picture, right? Picture, right? Right. The human body is part of the uh, the whole uh, uh, structure, right? Right. So he's not a bad draftsman, right? So he could do do so in the interest of an intended result because he was fully conscious of this, this form's composite elements. His incisive studies are the backbone of all of his paintings. The paintings are the fulfillment, his drawings, the structure, the basic vision. My thesis is based on Sejan's distortions and simplification, which is called simplification and object objectification in my paper, and further about how Sejan does it. Maya Shapiro, in 1952, made an acu acute study of the abstract side of Cezanne's art. The picture of card players exemplified the timeless moment of pure contemplation of thought without action. Have you seen the card players? Cezanne's painting, card players? Have a look, card players, right? Uh, this weight of thought and this Detachment from desire are the essential characteristics of Cezanne's art. His distortions arise from the effort to achieve a full equilibrium and harmony of forms. About the principal painting, Cezanne writes in a much quoted letter of 1904, painters should treat nature by means of the cylinder, the sphere, and cone. Right? Treat the nature, what? By means of the cylinder, Fear and the Corn, very famous uh, quote, uh, which were seized upon by the Cubists. At the same time, there is hardly a single cylinder, sphere, or cone to be found in his own work. Cezanne was probably referring to the system of drawing, the principle of drawing, right? Okay, we'll take uh, a 10 minutes break and uh, We'll read the rest of the essay on, on Thursday. Okay, thank you.